This is CBC Here and Now. Just to remember Hannah as a sweet, innocent child who had her life ahead of her. She loved life, a happy child. She loved everybody, had lots of friends. This didn't need to happen so tragic. Tonight, guilty of street racing causing death. Why a judge didn't buy Stephen Mercer's story. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Debbie Cooper. For the family of Hannah Thorne, it is the end of a painful chapter. A St. John's courtroom was full of emotion this morning when Justice William Goodridge found Stephen Mercer guilty of street racing, causing the death of 18-year-old Hannah Thorne. And while Mercer may not have been behind the wheel of the car that crashed, the judge says he was equally responsible. Here and Now's Jeremy Eaton reports. Sheriff's officers cuffed Stephen Mercer this morning after the guilty verdict. Hannah Thorne's mother yelled at him as he was led away. It's been uh, two and a half years and it's been dragged out that long and justice system is no walk in the park for the victims. I can tell you that it's been very stressful. Today, Justice William Goodridge found Mercer guilty on three charges, street racing causing death, street racing causing bodily harm and a breach of probation. Mercer's defense, he wasn't driving the car that was street racing with the truck that struck Thorne and her grandmother. But that's an argument that Goodridge didn't buy. He said the crash was inevitable. Mercer drove in a reckless manner and didn't bother to stop after the crash happened. It's hard to look at him in the face and just to see no reaction, no remorse. Just looking at the floor or in the space, whatever's on his mind, but... It don't seem like he's got any regrets. Back in July of 2016, Mercer and Brian King were street racing along this stretch of road when King's Ford F-150 slammed into the car carrying Hannah Thorne and her grandmother. Very hard on her. She had a lot to live with after a collision, a lot of trauma. It's not easy seeing your granddaughter die. She held her hand when she knew Hannah was gone. King pleaded guilty in 2017, was sentenced to four years, and has since been granted day parole. The Thorne family doesn't think Mercer will do much time either. What I'm hoping is <laughs> not reality, but uh, all we can ask for is the same as what Mr. King, and again, that's only a slap on the wrist. Nine months and he'll be walking the streets just as King is. The Thorne family hopes that with this guilty verdict, they can finally start to move on and begin to heal. But that's not going to happen right away. Mercer is scheduled to be back down here at Supreme Court on Friday for sentencing. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. In actual pain helps alleviate the emotional pain for a little bit. The rates of self-harm in this province are soaring, three times the national average in some areas. Tonight, Ryan Cook looks behind the numbers. The government is on the defensive again tonight over its decision to move a senior staffer to a high-profile job at the rooms. Carla Foote was given the job of Executive Director of Marketing and Development with a salary of $132,000 a year. The Liberals say it was a lateral move and these things happen all the time. But the opposition is questioning the process. Here now is Katie Breen was at the legislature today and joins us live from our newsroom. So Katie, the opposition says there's a process that should have been followed? Right. Well, government has an independent appointments commission that deals with agencies, boards, and commissions. It's merit-based, so in theory, political stripes shouldn't matter, and only the most qualified candidates get positions. But despite being the second highest paid person at the rooms, Carla Foote, in her role as executive director of marketing and development, didn't have to go through the independent process. It's not clear if there was even a standard interview. I had made the determination that Carla Foote was deemed the most qualified person to fill this particular role. Mitchell Moore's signature is on the staffing request asking that the Lieutenant Governor's daughter get the job. The Minister of Culture says the room's board and CEO would have gone through the independent process, but at Foote's level, that isn't required. They're trying to fudge the issue now because she seems to be like the second highest uh, ranking person at the room. So 
I mean, it sounds like an important enough position to me. The Liberal administration has come down hard on patronage in the past, but this is the second apparent case to surface recently. As part of the House of Assembly harassment issue still being worked through, it was alleged former Liberal Eddie Joyce tried to get his friend a job. I can't comment on any other matter that would be before the House in terms of uh, a report uh, that has been issued. I, I don't believe it has any correlation or connection. Opposition says political appointments need to stop. Foote may very well be the most qualified person for the job, they said, but without the proper process, it's hard to say for sure. I think that the job needs to be posted, that there needs to be a competition, and that whoever wants to apply can certainly apply. I asked to speak to the Premier today about all of this, but instead was directed to Mitchell Moore. The rooms also isn't talking. Reporting live from the newsroom, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. Christopher Mitchell Moore faced more questions from reporters today and will bring you his answers in 25 minutes. Right now, we've got questions about the weather. <laughs> Ashley, what, are we, what can we expect? Well, did you get outside at all today? Amazing. Holy it was so cow. warm. I couldn't believe it. My car at one point said 19.2 yeah, degrees. 20 degrees is what my car said earlier today. I, I, what did, I, did I move to the tropics? At least that's what it felt like. Uh, Human X values keep as well. Up. I know, keep it up. Human X values as well outside uh, at the airport, 25.2 degrees earlier today. So Amazing. that's crazy. Yeah, if we take a look at the current temperatures right now, uh, still sitting around 15 in St. John's. We're still well above seasonal. Should be sitting around 9 degrees this time of year. And we've got those warm temperatures right across the board. Corner Brook sitting at 12 degrees and then those cooler temperatures for uh, Labrador you know, earlier on Sunday morning uh, actually broke some cold temperature records. Uh, 22 minus 22 in Labrador City or uh, rather Walbush on Sunday morning. So quite chilly and then a very different story uh, today across the island. Now we did see all of that shower activity eventually end today with some clearing skies for the most part uh, right across the board. If we take a look at the satellite and radar with some uh, scattered showers expected as we head through the night tonight. I'll tell you how much rain fell and we'll talk about a little bit of roller coaster temperatures uh, coming up in a little bit. Carolyn. Thanks, Ashley. Well, a 65 year old man from Conch is dead after a boating mishap on Friday. RCMP Corporal Jolene Garland told CBC the man ran into engine trouble and his boat drifted into rough water where it capsized. The man's body was recovered the same day and an autopsy is scheduled. The police investigation continues. It's not clear if the man was wearing a life jacket at this time. A man from Natwashish has been charged with attempted murder. 31-year-old Nigel Rich was charged this morning. He appeared in court in Happy Valley Goose Bay. It all dates back to an August incident when the RCMP responded to a report that a man from the community had been seriously injured in an assault. Rich is expected back in court in early December. The owners of the fish plant gutted by fire in St. Mary's Bay last week planned to rebuild. The fire at Hickey and Sons in O'Donnell's destroyed the plant, and that's put 80 people out of work. The owners have insurance and do want to rebuild, but people in the area say it will be tough financially until then. Jane's brand pub style chicken burgers are being recalled due to possible salmonella contamination. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency says the frozen raw breaded chicken burgers were sold across the country. It says the burgers should be thrown out or returned. The 800 gram packages carry a best before date of May 14th, 2019. 25 illnesses in nine provinces have been reported with two hospitalizations. The CFIA is warning that contaminated food may not look or smell spoiled, but can still make you sick. A group that represents privately owned personal care homes says some seniors are being denied access to facilities, all because of changes the province has made. But government says that's not true. Here now's Mark Quinn explains. Seniors do not have an alternative. Right now this system is set up for a two-tier system. At a news conference to talk about improvements to seniors' care, Health Minister John Hagee was confronted by people saying the province has cut access to care. The group representing personal care homes says people with mental health issues who used to qualify for subsidies to live at their facilities don't get financial help anymore. 
And what they have determined that level one care residents can no longer go into personal care homes. The only way they can go in is if they have their own funds, if they're able to pay themselves. That's a two-tier system. While the Alliance says the province has changed the rules for deciding who receives subsidies, the health minister is adamant that it hasn't. I want to be clear, that is not the case. We have met with industry members on a number of occasions, both collectively and individually, to explain that there has been no change to the eligibility rules for placement in personal care homes. However, the regional health authorities have been directed to apply the current rules in a clear and consistent manner, which was not always the case. Haggy said the level of care guidelines are being scrutinized and changes may be coming, but he says that hasn't happened yet. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. People in this province are hurting themselves at an alarming rate. Hospitals reported a major increase in self-harm injuries last year, way above the national average. Ryan Cook has this report. I know for me that self-harm was a way to numb my feelings. Mackenzie Strait was 53 days harm free when she sat down to speak with us. Before that, she was often cutting and overdosing. Causing actual pain helped alleviate the emotional pain for a little bit. Strait is a patient at the Waterford Hospital in St. John's. She's also one of many people reflected in Stats Canada's latest numbers on self harm. Across the country, health authorities report how many self harm hospitalizations they have per every 100,000 people. There's no province higher than Newfoundland and Labrador. The national average sits at 68. Newfoundland and Labrador, however, comes in at 105. And it's been on the rise since 2014. Are those surprising facts to you? Not really, no. Not, and I'm not surprised at all, to be honest with you. We spoke with TJ Smith, who runs a mental health support group in St. Anthony. He's noticed a dangerous trend of self-harm on the Northern Peninsula. The self-harm, it's, it's younger teenagers and younger adults, and perhaps they're not getting a proper education or they're not getting educated at all on other coping mechanisms. And it's happening way worse the further you get from St. John's. Western Health is double the national rate. Labrador Grenfell, meanwhile, is three and a half times the average. We were unable to get an interview with Labrador Grenfell Health to ask them why this is happening in their region. But it does seem to be a trend among northern regions of the country. Newfoundland and Labrador may be the highest province in Canada, but the territories are always even higher. Smith believes geography plays a large part in those numbers. Logistically, it's tough for some people to get the necessary help they need. St. Anthony is six hours from Cornerbrook. There's a small hospital here, but it serves a massive area. Smith is seeing more and more people turning to his support group each week looking for help. The health minister deferred comment on this story to the health authorities. Labrador Grenfell has programs they think will help bring those numbers back down. The biggest thing is the doorways program, walk-in mental health counseling that's eliminated wait times in several areas of the province. In St. John's, Mackenzie Strait says more needs to be done when people come through the doors of a hospital. While they're in there, sure, they have their nurses and doctors to speak to, but you're not learning any coping mechanisms. You're not learning how to deal with it, like deal with your thoughts and stuff. So people are still in their self-harming because for a lot of people, that's the only way they know how to cope. Without education, she fears that number will keep soaring above the national average. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. Would not live here if they take away the livestock. You you killed the farm. A small livestock farm in the middle of brand new beautiful suburbia. The farm owners don't want to go anywhere, but the developers and the town want them out. I'll take you to Kippens.
Welcome back, everyone. Ernie Chancy has been lacing up his skates in St. John's for 65 years now. He remembers skating behind the old Hotel Newfoundland and being at the opening of Memorial Stadium. Wow, that's a while back. Uh, so it should come as no surprise that on his 85th birthday, he hit the rink with his partner just as he does every Monday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Only this time he was in for quite the surprise. <laughs> I, I've been skating since uh, 1952. It's general skating, you know, skating the music, uh, since 1952. And uh, I started at the old curling rink uh, behind the Newfoundland Hotel, and not many remember that now. But uh, I started there, and then when the Memorial Stadium opened, I skated down there. That was uh, Sherry uh, Jane's. Uh, we, we've been skating together for about five years now. You know. She's only a youngster. <laughs> he came and asked me to skate, and I said, no, Ern, I can't skate with you. I'll trip you up. And then he came back the second time, and he said, can I ask you to skate again? I said, I'm going to trip you up. I'm not a good skater. So I went back third time, and she, <laughs> she skated with me. The worst thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> weather update is brought to you by Harvey's Home Heating. Complete furnace replacement if yours cannot be repaired. That's furnace freedom. Visit harveyshomeheating.ca for more. Well, she's back at it again, <laughs> Carolyn's Bees. Yeah, so not only are you preparing your garden for winter, mm -hmm. uh, you're getting your beehive ready for winter too, right? Yeah, so they can make it through the winter and learning some more fun facts about bees along the way, including something very interesting about the gender dynamic in the hive. Just have a look. Leaves are changing and the temperature is dropping, so now it's time to get my honeybees ready for winter. A lot of people, I think, don't realize that bees can survive over the winter. They cluster in a very tight, a very tight ball. The queen is in the middle. The bees on the outside of the circle are vibrating their wing muscles, and, the, and it actually raises the temperature in the hive. As the bees on the outside start to get cool, the bees that are warm on the inside will come out and replace them, and they'll go in and get warm again. The queen is always in the center, nice and toasty and looked after oh, yeah, wooden good. shavings, right? Nice and dry. And what does this do? This is very important to keep the bees warm, but also to catch the moisture. This is uh, roofing felt, and we just wrap basically like a horseshoe just around the back and sides of the hive, but the front is left exposed. It's nice and dark, and it's going to attract the heat and, and warm the hive. Okay, but we don't, we don't put it on the front because we don't want them to become overheated. So there's all females in this hive now, no males. All the males are gone. What happened to the males? They kicked them out of the hive because they just eat honey and uh, mate with the queen, so they're, they're gone. So they're of no use over winter? No use. They're, they're totally useless. <laughs> they're, they, that's it, so they get thrown out. It's a great way to, to conserve the amount of honey they have, mm -hmm. and, uh, and over winter the hive with just females. Amazing, right? They're totally useless. <laughs> totally useless. <laughs> That's as far as I'm going with that. <laughs> it's amazing because, you know, the female bees, they do everything in the hive. They clean it, protect it. They take care of the babies. They, you know, forage and bring in all the nectar and honey. And the male bees, the drones, they don't do much. They just eat and they mate with the queen and that's it. So <sighs> over winter, they're bye-bye so they can <laughs> conserve the honey. And I uh, couldn't help but notice your pink bee suit. Oh yeah. I love it. Oh, thanks. I need one. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta go pink, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, um, you know, we're not ta just talking about bees, but take a look at this photo that was sent in today. So oh. cute. This is Shaky the Squirrel. <laughs> he has a and name. Yeah, I guess he, he feeds off of the hand and they let him put that on the, his head. Oh, he's that oh. tame already? Yeah, he's that tame. Oh, it's cute. A, just adorable photo there. Oh, that, just, David. that made me so happy, David. Yeah, it was a great photo. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we were talking about uh, these warm temperatures just before the break. Yeah. Uh, you know, we reached a high here 
in St. John's unofficially 19.1 degrees I think at the airport wow. but a number of areas saw temperatures in the 20s so if we take a look at uh, those temperatures through the day 19 degrees as I mentioned 18 in uh, Badger Deer Lake sitting at 13 degrees earlier today now these temperatures are going to be quite similar tomorrow as well maybe a couple of degrees cooler but if we take a look at the current temperatures it's just dropped just a little bit about 15 degrees in St. John's 12 in Corner Brook right now uh, temperatures over Night going to drop to the single digits and then we'll see again we'll see those temperatures climb right back up so taking a look at the amount of rainfall since Sunday morning, this includes the freezing rain that fell as well. Uh, 66.7 millimeters for Porta Bass Bergio saw the most at 111.9. And then uh, that most of that freezing rain, as you can see, fell up through Corner Brook, through Badger, Twillingate as well. 41.5 millimeters of rain in total. And then on the Avalon, not too much, about 16.4 was recorded in St. John. So if we take a look at the current satellite and radar, all of that rain has moved moved off. We're seeing some clearing skies as well. Just a few cloudy periods. Uh, and then as we head through the next couple of hours, we're going to see that chance of showers tonight and then up through Labrador. All of that uh, cloud cover is rain or rather snow. So we do have um, some snowfall warnings in place from Hopedale down through to Makovic. Now Rigolet is going to see somewhere between 10 to 15 centimeters, not quite warning criteria, but still uh, quite a bit of snowfall. This is expected to fall. Uh, as we head through the day on through the night tonight and then into Tuesday. You can see all of that uh, snow move in the heaviest tonight. Now, Happy Valley Goose Bay changed over to rain at some point uh, earlier today, and that should change back over to either a rain snow mix or snow altogether as those temperatures continue to drop. Otherwise, across the island, just the chance of some scattered showers. Most of the heavy rain or rather periods of rain will fall through the day again tomorrow and then continue on um, Wednesday as well. And then by the time the trick-or-treaters head out it does look like things should taper to showers or drizzle into the overnight period so taking a look at the forecast for tonight, we are still looking at the chance of fog uh, patches through the night. Another five millimeters on the way for Port of Basque. Seven degrees should be the overnight low tonight. Corner Brook, five degrees. Uh, and then heading towards the Avalon, still sitting in the single digits overnight tonight for St. John's, around 10 degrees. But those winds will eventually ease. Up through Labrador, though, again, either rain or snow mix for Happy Valley Goose Bay, hovering around the zero degree mark. 10 to 15 centimeters along the coast. Now, Cartwright likely seeing about two to four millimeters millimeters of rain inland areas that should fall as snow could see a couple of centimeters there five to ten on the way for Nain and then a couple of centimeters on the way for Lab City as well uh, sitting around minus four through the overnight tonight so uh, we will when I come back we'll take a look at tomorrow's forecast and we'll talk about the temperature trends as well thanks Ashley well a longtime farmer on the west coast is about to lose everything Gerard O'Coin attends to his sheep goats and pig on his land in Kippens. His farm has been there for generations, but the town wants to put an end to it. Here and now's Colleen Connors has more. Orchard Lane in Kippens, a well manicured subdivision with just a few mansions on the corner. At the end of one cul-de-sac, Whitey the pig gets its mid-morning snack. Apples from the nearby orchard. I have uh, pigs. Yeah. Goats, sheep, uh, hens, I even have a turkey. I even have a turkey? Yeah, a wild turkey named Tom. A coin and his wife Cora own this family farm and live here off the grid. Since 2012, houses have been going up all around them. They don't mind the shingles and the siding view, but O'Coin doesn't want to leave. It's my heritage and I am very proud of it. The farm has been in his family since 1895. But this year, the town of Kippens issued removal orders, telling him to get rid of fencing, sheds, and his beloved livestock. The first order was rescinded, but they received a second in the mail just last week. O'Coin believes the town rezoned to residential, but never told him. Now he's losing it all. I was really shocked, dumbstruck, but uh, I, now I'm putting pieces together and, they, and it's injustice. Uh, without the livestock, I cannot continue my way of life. I'm an organic farmer. I believe in biodynamics. Uh, I don't think it should be taken away. The livestock is his livelihood. I would not live here if they take away the livestock. 
you, you killed the firm. No one with the town returned our calls. No one with the subdivision developer, Millbrook Development Company, would get back to us either. According to the removal order, O'Coin has to go. O'Coin believes some of the developers and some town councillors want him out of that subdivision. No matter what the town has to say, O'Coin says he's not going anywhere. He plans on fighting the town and hiring a lawyer to help do that and says he will be here long past the June 2019 deadline. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Kippins. Carlo Foote has 20 years of experience when it comes to communications. On the defensive, government is still under fire for a move that critics call pure political patronage. It's over the room's job given to longtime liberal Carla Foote, who got the position without having to go through a job competition. made the decision to hire Carla Foote as Executive Director of Marketing and Development at The Rooms. And Ms. Foote had served in an executive level role in government as an ADM or DM equivalent. And she has made a lateral move to The Rooms, which is part of government. Same salary, same qualifications. And it is not 
Debating Carla Foote's job in the House of Assembly, Minister of Tourism Christopher Mitchell Moore is on the defensive as critics question why a former liberal communications advisor gets an executive job at the rooms with no competition. And as we learned today, not only was there no competition, the hiring of Carla Foote came at the specific request of the minister. Mitchell Moore told reporters today that he was the one who reached out to the rooms, requesting that Foote be given the job. So who told the rooms that they should hire her? When it comes to any position of uh, hire and as minister responsible, I certainly uh, I, I want to have the best people qualified when it comes to working at the rooms and uh, when it comes to working in government. So uh, I had made the determination that Carla Foote was deemed the most qualified person to fill this particular role. The rooms gets $6.2 million from government. Uh, you are the representative of government. You call them or send them a letter saying we want you to hire this person. Do you think that the rooms, because of that, felt pressure to say yes? The uh, rooms receives $6.2 million uh, from, from government, but it also generates its own revenue, and it's been doing a very good job of that. This is a collaborative approach, and we certainly, as minister, I want to ensure that the rooms has the autonomy that it does to deliver on the mandate that is before them. And that's why we have a CEO and we have a board of directors. And as I said, when these executive level positions came forward, we had that consultation. And uh, this has been done in collaboration with HRS and and approved by the room's board. Mr. Mitchell Moore has admitted that he gave direction to the board or to the, the chair or somebody at the rooms as to uh, making this contract. So uh, that, uh, that's alarming. Why? Well, it's, it's alarming because the Ball government came to power on a series of promises which they emphasized gave a great deal of emphasis, emphasis to that they were going to make appointments based on merit. And when they came in, they set up that process, the independent appointments process. And it is supposed to apply to these independent agencies, boards, and commissions. And now it seems that they found a way around it. She may sense. very well be you know, perfectly qualified for this job. A lot of people have been saying that. But she is. It, is this kind of fair to her? Like, if you had your time back, would you do this differently, considering everything that's happened and all the backlash and all the criticism? Do you, do you still think that moving her laterally was the right move? Well, I think certainly a lateral move, giving somebody the opportunity to excel their skills and uh, help the rooms elevate, work with the team, and deliver for the people of the province is a good move. I have uh, no uh, issue with her moving in the lateral move that she has. And I find it very unfortunate, the uh, message and uh, how things have taken uh, a toll. Did you but do like an interview or submit a resume? Did she sit down with board members or, or was she just kind of given the position without having to really do anything or submit anything? Like was her resume reviewed? Did she sit down with them, do interviews, that sort of thing? When it comes to somebody moving into an executive level role, it would be uh, important to make sure that the person who is moving into that role would have ample qualifications and ample ability. And I certainly believe in Carla Foote and her ability as to what she can deliver at the rooms and for the people of the province. She has 20 years of experience and she was in a position, an executive level position for the last three years, had reformed marketing and communications within government and she will do an incredible job at the rooms in that role. This is not uncommon for people to move from an executive level position to another executive level position within government. You didn't and answer her question though. Uh, did she have to do any kind of interview? Was there any kind of review of qualifications? Yes or no? There would have been outreach to uh, Ms. Foote in that process, but I would not have, have been involved in the particular process about uh, how the job uh, would have been offered, the contract, and those details. Those are HR matters that would be dealt with through the appropriate process. Well, good morning in Gander. I'm Martin Jones. And I'm Bernice Hillier in Cornerbrook. This is CBC Newfoundland Morning. CBC Radio's newest morning show launched today. CBC Newfoundland Morning is co-hosted by Bernice Hillier in Cornerbrook and Martin Jones in Gander. We'll talk to them next.
announce a new day at CBC Radio in our province. The launch of a new morning show hosted from Gander and Cornerbrook and broadcasting as far as the Northern Peninsula and Southern Labrador. And joining me now are the hosts of CBC Newfoundland Morning, Martin Jones and Bernice Hillier. Welcome to you both. How was the first show, Martin? Wow, um, it was a bit of a blur, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Three hours went by like that. Um, it was a lot of fun. We had a few technical issues, but that was behind the scenes. But uh, overall, I think it went well. So Bernice, a bit of a blur for you as well? It certainly was. I think Martin and I enjoyed our first morning together on the radio, serving people <laughs> right across a much larger region than we've been used to. Yeah. So staying with you, Bernice, what challenge does it present to be in different locations and, and gel as a team? You know, Anthony and I have visual cues to help us not walk over each other most of the time. So is it a challenge, do you think? Well, we have a video conference set up, so we are able to see each other during the live show. And we keep in touch through text and email and Google chat. And so we're always in constant contact, probably uh, throughout the day and not just during those three hours, but <laughs> certainly very much in communication during the three-hour show. Martin? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think we probably talk more after the show and into the night than we probably do during the three hours. Um, but yeah, we get to see face to face, eye to eye, and we have chats throughout the show. But it's great to see each other on screen, even though we're a couple of hundred kilometers apart. But uh, yeah, I think it makes a big difference for sure as well. We get to actually have real chats live on the air. Yeah. So Martin, what's going to be different for listeners in Central and the West Coast? Well, I think initially you're going to hear a different sound. I mean, we have different theme music. It's a different pace and a different tempo for the show. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of similarities. So we're still going to have the same voices that people are used to in Central and on the West Coast. Um, but at the same time, we're going to get out of the, of the studio even more than we already do and get into communities face to face with the people that we're telling the stories of. Um, I know I speak for myself here, but I know I speak for Bernice as well and all of us, that that is one of the biggest advantages of doing this show the way we're doing it now, is that we really get out and about and into the places, in, into the communities where we're actually reporting from. So Bernice, expand on that a little bit. You're having reporters now fanning out to cover stories. The, the idea is that we'll get out of the station more and able to do more interviews face to face and find out what's really going on in communities right across this larger region because we've got resources freed up to have the time to pursue stories in that way. When we've been producing uh, two local morning shows, it's been challenging at times to be able to do that, but we're going to be able to do it more and more. So speaking of challenges, Bernice, what challenge are you looking forward to the most with this no new show and then to you Martin. Well, I'm just thrilled to be able to serve the larger region. I actually started with CBC Gander and CBC Grand Falls Windsor many years ago, and so I feel like it's a bit of a homecoming for me to be able to once again tell the stories of the Northeast Coast, the Bonavista Peninsula, the Bayvert Peninsula. Martin? I think for us, I think it's proving to the listeners that have been with us over the years in whatever show they were listening to that we still have that local voice. I mean, we've debuted the show now, we've debuted the new music and the new everything else. Now it's time to prove to people that they don't have to worry about it not being a, a local show anymore, that we're still going to do the same stories that we did all over the last so many decades, um, and we're still there for them in their region. I think that's going to be the challenge, but it's going to be one that we're all looking forward to actually proving, I think. Yeah. That oh, sounds wonderful. We're going to leave it there. Congratulations to you both, and good luck with Newfoundland Morning. Thanks, Thank Debbie. you. Well, turning now to some international news that's being felt around the world, including here in this province. Mourners held vigils around the globe over the weekend for victims of a shooting at a Pittsburgh synagogue. Canadians gathered in Halifax, Montreal, Vancouver, and last night in Ottawa. Dozens attended an event at the nation's capital, in part to remember the victims, but also to show a united front against anti-Semitism and xenophobia. Overseas, Americans were among hundreds of people who held a candlelight vigil in Jerusalem. Some said they felt a strong sense of community in their home away from home. And a candlelight vigil is being held tonight in St. John's for victims of the Pittsburgh shooting. Here now as Malone Mullen is there and joins us now live. So Malone, what's the scene there now? 
Well, people are just starting to filter in. We've got volunteers, they're setting up uh, tables, they've got candles that they want to give out just to get everyone involved. And I'm actually here with the lead organizers. I've got Justin Tobin and I've got Sarah Mae Rahal who came up with the idea just this morning. Yeah. What do you have planned tonight? Uh, tonight we're hosting a candlelight vigil for the events that happened in Pittsburgh on Saturday. Uh, it's just to commemorate in memory and remember the lives that were taken uh, on Saturday. And it's to get the community together and in solidarity and support for the Jewish community, but larger communities within St. John's. Right. And Justin, um, you are involved with the Jewish community here in St. John's. What kind of an impact did this tragedy have? It definitely had a lot of impacts. It had surprise, shock, fear, but as I've said before, mostly determination. Determination that these types of things are not okay. They're not okay in Pittsburgh. They're not okay in Israel. They're not okay in New York, even St. John's, Newfoundland. We all need to take a stand against anti-Semitism. Can you tell us what, like, why is it important to hold a vigil right here in St. John's? It's very important. Pittsburgh is, I don't know, about 3,000 kilometers away, but this type of event, it could have happened 2,000 kilometers, 200 kilometers. This could have been me. I go to a synagogue and pray. I go to Jewish events. All Jewish lives are important and all lives are important in general. We need to raise more awareness and more education about this. What was your reaction when you heard about the news on Saturday? I remember feeling cold and just like realizing like, wow, that could have been me and my boyfriend we go to Sarish together regularly and it made me feel like uh, I had to help, I had to do something, that the names of the 11 people who were murdered had to be remembered. Now there are candlelight vigils being held in Canada, all across Canada. That's been happening uh, yesterday, it's happening tonight. What are you hoping will come from this? I'm really unsure and I guess you could ask me the question again in about an hour's time, but I'm hoping a sense of community. I'm hoping for understanding. I hope that everyone who comes, that, that the little Jewish kids that seen this on TV after they watched their children's shows, that they go home feeling safe, that they know that people care about them, and that they can sleep easier at night, because I know that they could not Saturday. Well, thanks very much, Justin. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Sarah. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. So the ceremony will start here in just a few minutes in Bannerman Park. Uh, everybody is welcome to come down to show their support, to light a candle, and to pay their respects to the Jewish communities here and in Pittsburgh. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Malone Mullen in St. John's. One of Europe's most powerful politicians is resigning. After nearly two decades and a reputation few can match, Germany's Angela Merkel is leaving politics. Merkel's decision to step down as leader comes after her party's poor showing in several recent elections. She says it's time to open a new chapter. Merkel says she will stay on as chancellor until her term ends in 2021. The powerhouse, whom Germans called Mother, has led one of Europe's most successful post-war parties. So the more blood, the more gore, the better. Well, this is no ordinary makeover. Just in time for Halloween, this makeup artist is conjuring up some spooky looks. Lots of drying in between, lots of blow drying.
Welcome back once again. And before we launch into the video, uh, into the weather, <laughs> the video we have is uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, check out this close encounter captured near Mary's Harbor in Labrador. Aww. <laughs> this was uh, taken yesterday by Gordon Montague, howling wolf just five minutes outside of Happy Valley Goose Bay. This is a pretty rare video of a wild wolf. I don't know. Calling out to his friends, I guess. I wouldn't want to get that close. Nope. That's a little too close for comfort for me. <laughs> it does sound mournful though, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> it sounds sad. Beautiful wow. animal though. Mm, and yeah. look at the weather. It looks beautiful. It's very, very different there uh, than it is in our neck of the woods. I'd say that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, temperatures tomorrow up into Labrador are going to stay on the plus side of the mercury for some areas. If we take a look at uh, the forecast right for tomorrow, four degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay, uh, either rain or snow through the afternoon because those temperatures will be sitting uh, above zero. And then Lab City going to see some lingering flurries through the day. Might uh, pick up a couple centimeters, but most likely just a trace uh, around one degree into the afternoon, another five centimeters on the way for Nain. And then again, that rain falling for along the coast for Cartwright towards inland areas, likely uh, about two more centimeters on the way tomorrow. Otherwise, those temperatures again across the island, quite warm corner book, uh, not quite as warm though, sitting around nine degrees, around seasonal for this time of year. Uh, periods of rain moving through Grand Falls, Windsor as well, 10 degrees, a couple to about four millimeters of rain on the way for Buren and then Gander could see about five to 10 millimeters through the day, reaching a high near 14 degrees. So another warm one expected 15 in St. John. So if we take a look at the future tracker. We can see that all that rain move in through the day tomorrow, heavy at times as well. And then into the overnight, we'll uh, see some lingering shower activity. That'll be the case as we head through the day on Monday or rather Wednesday as well. Uh, and then showers or flurries uh, expected for Labrador along the coast is where we could potentially see that shower activity. And then towards the evening hours, once uh, it's time to trick or treat, it does look like things should clear out for the most part or taper to showers through the evening hours. Temperatures though are going to drop back down into Wednesday night and Thursday. Uh, if we take a look at what we're expected. So 15 degrees tomorrow, eight on Wednesday, five by the time Thursday rolls around, and then we're going to jump right back up into next week. Now, these temperatures might change over the next couple of days. The system isn't, uh, the track of the system isn't exactly uh, perfect right now. But uh, that average temperature sitting around nine degrees through the day. So uh, a return of that warm weather. And then again, by Monday, it looks like we'll dip back down into the single digits. So taking a look at your five day forecast for St. John's in eastern Newfoundland, uh, 15 degrees again tomorrow, about five to 10 millimeters on the way. Uh, Wednesday it looks like uh, eight degrees and then going to dip down into the single digits through the overnight. Thursday, plenty of sunshine and five degrees. And then there's that warm up again for uh, the weekend. Now for Western Lab uh, Newfoundland, we're going to see the same thing. Not quite as warm though, about seven degrees by Friday. That chance of showers right across the board. Zero degrees on Wednesday night, so we could see the rain or flurries there. Same thing for Central, uh, about one degree overnight on Wednesday. Into Thursday, Friday, more sun and cloud with that risk of showers through the day. And then for Western Labrador, two degrees or minus two rather on Wednesday evening. Friday looks like plenty of sunshine and then that chance of flurries will remain on Saturday. And that's the case uh, for Eastern Labrador as well. Either rain or snow tomorrow, about four degrees. And then into Thursday, we'll see those temperatures uh, back around two degrees, three on Friday with a mix of sun and clouds. So that's a look at your outlook. We'll uh, have your weather photo coming up after the break. Thanks, Ashley. And Debbie, uh, just two more sleeps now until Halloween. Oh, a lot of excited <laughs> young people out there mm -hmm. getting the costumes prepared. Some of them kind of spooky looking, yes. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Jamie Stamp is a fan of all things horror, and she has a couple of very busy days ahead. That's because Jamie has the power to transform you from an ordinary person into any number of evil creatures. Mm, interesting. <laughs> the CBC's Mark Cumby met up with her to uh, talk about her special effects project on this week's edition of What Are You At? What are you at? My name is Jamie Stamp and I do special effects makeup. 
So far I've worked on a few short films, my own included, and first time short films. And I'd like, in the long run, to do bigger films and stuff like that. Dang it. Is it you? I don't have many people that look at me when I do the makeup and don't say, that is disgusting, <laughs> go somewhere else. They all think it's pretty gross, but at the same time, they think it's pretty cool. And I've had a lot of people say to me that they think that, you know, I found my calling, this is what I was meant to do. Uh, I always had a love for film, and horror movies are probably about my favorite. So the more blood, the more gore, the better. I did a 48-hour film challenge last year with NIFCO, and it was a horror challenge. So I needed special effects. I had none. I YouTubed, you know, different ways to make blood different ways to do this and do that, and that's kind of where it started. It's basically layers upon layers of liquid latex and tissue paper and cotton balls. Uh, lots of drying in between, lots of blow drying. Uh, and then after it's all applied and said and done, I paint it with uh, water-based face paints, and then I go over it again with fake blood. Yeah, I can't see my life without special effects makeup in it at this point. I can't see myself doing anything else that's not artistically related. Wow. What Do You At is produced with our colleagues at CBC Radio's Weekend AM with Heather Barrett. And you can catch Wham! each Saturday and Sunday morning from 6 to 9.30 Newfoundland time, of course, on CBC Radio. And do you have an interesting hobby or activity? Let the team know at wham at cbc.ca. Well, we have this shot. Wow. I didn't get a chance to show it on Friday, but uh, a beautiful picture there from last week, the high surf. Any idea where that is? Oh, I wonder what it be. No, not <laughs> so too high. I was going to say the southern shore somewhere because they had high seas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Beautiful coastline. The shore looks mm, stunning. The water looks gorgeous. I <laughs> did. Yeah, hey, talk about the tropics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll tell you where this photo is coming up after the break. Well, there's a look at that uh, beautiful weather shot there, or should we say surf shot there. Uh, so do you any guesses? 
No, I, I nice. said mountains, I meant hills, but it, <laughs> you know, the shoreline. Uh, no, I haven't got anything. Okay, Northern well, Bay. Yeah. Beautiful. A lot of people enjoy going out there in the summer, for sure. Mm -hmm. I used to go out there a lot when my children were young. Yeah. Play in the uh, sand. Yeah, beautiful so turquoise water. Yeah, thank you, Jean Shaw, for that photo. Uh, if you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. See you tomorrow. Good night. Good night.